The following podcast is for informational purposes only. The contents of this podcast do not constitute tax, legal, or investment advice. Take responsibility for your own decisions, consult with the proper professionals, and do your own research. In the Bitcoin ecosystem, since we are also EVM compatible, we need Web3 infrastructure middleware like the graph. We're talking to Layer Zero. We're talking to a few other kind of along the way as well. They are serving a very important function. TIQ podcast. Today I'm speaking with Charlie Hu, co founder at BitLayer, a pioneering Bitcoin Layer 2 solution based on the BitVM paradigm. Before launching BitLayer, Charlie made significant contributions in other notable projects, including Polkadot and Polygon. I've been excited to interview Charlie for a couple of reasons. First, his insights into business, startups, Web3 community, and the industry landscape are incredibly enlightening, as you'll soon discover. Second, amidst the growing interest in the programmability of Bitcoin and the rise of Bitcoin Layer 2 solutions like BitLayer, Charlie offers valuable insights and commentary. And lastly, Charlie provides a fascinating perspective on the evolution of Web3 in Asia, which I think you'll find useful in understanding this dynamic region of the world. I started the discussion with Charlie by asking about where his drive for entrepreneurship comes from. First of all, thank you very much, Nick, for the invitation. I'm super glad to be on the podcast. Hey, everybody, for the people who are listening. My name is Charlie. I originally come from China. I've been kind of an entrepreneur, an investor, sort of two sides of the table for a while. So my entrepreneurial drive come from, I guess, this early stage when I was a child. I'm, I'm a big fan of heavy metal, rock music, and so on. So this kind of interesting, rebellious energy or vibe inside of my heart is always there. If you want to be an entrepreneur, you need that. For the people who like to obey rules, who like to just you know, follow the discipline and the orders and don't like to disrupt things, you might not be the person to actually be an entrepreneur, right? Because you, know, you might be a very good corporate executive and climb up the career ladder, which is also fine. We need people like that working for the government, working for the big corporates. For me, being an entrepreneur is about you know, try to fix some things which people think for granted, but doesn't really work in the way you believe actually the right order. And, you know, so I think that's that. And the rebellious is actually one side. And I'm a very good disruptor, or, or we call this like hacker. I like to hack things around when I was a teenager. So I win like national prize on electronic engineering competition. Although I wouldn't say I'm a best engineer. I actually didn't study engineering in my bachelor degree and master degree. I studied business. But I think have this kind of hustler plus hacker kind of mentality is very helpful to be an entrepreneur. And it's like a natural evolution, right? Eventually, you start to learning about all the entrepreneurs. I start following about Elon Musk's story, Peter Thiel's story, you know, all these entrepreneur stories from Stanford, all these like and online courses. I follow a lot of them when I was like middle school, high school. Obviously, those kind of give me this kind of priority list, right? Every time there's some crazy, amazing, inspiring entrepreneurial stories, I like to read that and so on. For any listener that wants to be an entrepreneur, you clearly have been one. You've also worked on the venture capital side of things, so you've funded entrepreneurs. What's the one important lesson that you think everybody should kind of know about entrepreneurship before they begin? So it's really not about you think being an entrepreneur is cool and you want to be an like one. That's what we call this one entrepreneur. Being an entrepreneur is actually very hard. A great book written by you know co-founder of A16Z, right, Ben, is the hardest thing about a hard thing. Starting a company is so hard. You need to chew in glasses. You need to do a lot of things, which is very lonely. And you need to fix a lot of stuff, right? So it's not that cool. Like It's not like a rock star on a stage or whatever. Not at all. There's like 99% of the time, actually, a lot of tough stuff to work on, right? You need to work over time. A lot of people actually say that. I, I agree 100% as well, which is there's no such a thing called a work-life balance. So for the people who wants to be an entrepreneur, had never done that before, and who think being an entrepreneur is so cool, I just want to kind of manage the expectation a bit, right? For the people who really driven to be an like entrepreneur, who wants to solve 
certain interesting problems and important problems that actually create impact for the society, for the world. I think it's about finding the inner drive, right? Something really makes you feel itchy, like you want to fix that. That sheer drive of fix that problem and help people or help certain things to make it better, cheaper, faster in certain ways, move the needle. And that drive can give you this kind of fun. You know, it's more than just making money. I think that's very important. Without that, it's actually very difficult to justify. You're working overtime. You sacrifice your life quality. You don't actually have the work-life balance. You sometimes need to sacrifice a lot of, a lot of friendship. When friends ask you for, to go out for a party or whatever, you have to say no a lot of times and so on. Does it worth it? Let's put on your venture capital hat here, but you've got entrepreneurs showing up in front of you. They've got ideas. They've got visions of the future. You've seen a lot of them. What's the two or three skills that you're looking for in an entrepreneur? What do they need to be good at? It may not necessarily be the very thing they're working on. It might be skills that support that. But what's your perspective on that? I will put that into two categories because I worked in Web2 kind of a entrepreneur and also VC cycle before my crypto journey. I mean, around 2011 to 2013, I worked in an accelerator in Amsterdam. You know, during that period of time, I got to know a lot of Web2 you know, Web2 companies, startups in Netherlands was one of the most entrepreneurial country in Europe, probably by top three in the world as well, right? They have a lot of great founders from Netherlands. So I was working there, there in one of the very famous accelerator called Rockstar. I met a lot of uh, VCs, NGOs, and, and, and founders every day. But that's Web3, non-Web3, you know, founders, right? I didn't enter Bitcoin or Web3 and, until like 2015. During that period of time, I think... Very important for founders to understand and a skill set is you are able to find interesting insights. You need to be able to find signal, you know, when there's a lot of noises there, right? The noise from the propaganda, from the media, from a lot of uh, like he said, she said kind of rumors, right? There's people kind of give you all kinds of free talks, right? They like what you do, but actually it's, not, it's just for the sake of making you feel good. One, but if you really do the market insights, like research, and actually ask people what you're willing to pay for that, the, the reality is most likely people actually don't want to, right? Things like that. So to be an entrepreneur, you need to be very brutal, honest to yourself and to the society, how certain things work, how the system works and so on. So we saw a lot of entrepreneurs actually got some good ideas. They always be very protective, right? They want to protect the idea because they don't want to share. But eventually the idea it was not validated. Right? There was a lot of cases in Web2 world, a lot of st certain startups wants to build an app. They think this idea is great because certain people like that, but they didn't have a very scientific research ar around it. And then they, they start working on that and they actually spend time and money, you know, pay some developers, work on some apps, which actually validated the idea. So that's kind of the whole, you know, the whole philosophy or methodology of a lean startup, right? To really uh, get the idea out, actually valid start validation in a very very low cost, very fast way, and I iteratively actually work towards that, to work towards the real product, market fit, getting a prototype down, and then you start pitching to the real investors. So while I was working in Accelerator, we saw a lot of rough ideas. Great founders, great passion, but the idea was simply wrong because of the timing was not ready. There's no product market fit. You know, certain things just, just doesn't really work in the logic. So that was there a lot. On the crypto side, so my journey, I bought my first Bitcoin in 2012. I got to know Ethereum when I went to Berlin in early 2015, especially the parity team who were building Ethereum wallet and Ethereum clients. So Gavin Wood, who was the CTO of Ethereum, was the main leader on that. I started following him about what is Web3, since then, and so on. And he left Ethereum, started Polkadot, right? So that was kind of the journey. Early Ethereum was kind of interesting, exciting, and like early stage. Like a lot of developers, very smart people, who actually know how to do code like C++, C++, C and Solidity, they start talking about the future of finance, the future of society and all kinds of things, right? The programmable money and so on. So Ethereum was a very interesting, you know, this kind of infinite garden. They attract a lot of interesting developers with a lot of great minds, right? So that was early days. If we talk about entrepreneurship on, on Web3, the difference is that it's a very philosophical driven, mindset driven uh, space in the early days. Meaning it's not a, just about a product. You know, it's not just like if you have a product market fit, you could get it. It's really about it. Do you actually have an interesting narrative and, and actually a community that actually like the philosophy, right? So it's a bit more like abstract. Compared to Web2, I would say Web3, in the early days of a, a starting a, a company, a starting a project, is very um, 
culture, mindset, or community driven. Ethereum was not the best product market fit in the early stage. It was really just because like they had the best community of builders who actually get along very well. In the beginning, they had a shared mindset. Vitalik was very visionary. And then Gavin and a bunch of other people start actually picking up, start working on that together. Even up to this moment, EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine, is still the biggest developer you know, environment for all kinds of DeFi and all kinds of dApps, right? Would you argue if EVM is the best technology in the world? We, we would definitely say it's maybe not, where right? we have Solana VM, Movie, and a bunch of others coming along the ways. But if, if we talk about adoption, EVM is still kind of the most adopted smart contract environment in the world, right? And actually, that was, that was because of this, you know, the community and so on. So for a founder to do something, try to do something in Web3, it's really about two, three things. One, like what's the best narrative, right? Like what are the things actually creating new cycle, in this new cycle, creating the best narrative with the strongest consensus? And two is what kind of assets you can create on chain? <laughs> Last cycle was, in 2021, was definitely NFT. A gaming NFT, all kinds of JPEG NFT or metaverse, right? This cycle, we could argue with meme coin, we could argue with many other stuff, right? So what kind of assets you're creating? Like digital assets is something which is new, which is unique in Web3. Because in Web2, you don't create assets. You're creating information. You create dApps. That's pretty much it. And it's, most of dApps is, is centralized, owned by the big company, right? Well, unfortunately. Whereas if in Web3, digital assets owned by the community you know, minted on the, on the network, right? So that's different. The, three thing, the, the third thing I think is very different on Web3 compared to Web2 entrepreneurship is are you able to build a community? For Web2, if you build a best app, you manage to feature it on, let's say, Product Hunt or very good at, at doing SEO on Google, you probably have a, com- com- a company that makes money already, right? Whereas in Web3, if you don't have community, you, if you never actually be able to build a community, it's very difficult to justify you can be a successful multiple billion FTV projects. I barely see anyone like that. Charlie, you have, as you mentioned, a degree in business and finance. You are entrepreneurially driven. You're clearly very smart, very well read. You could have done anything in terms of your career and profession. You decided, however, to pursue Web3 and to work in this space. What drew you into this space? Why did you decide to go here? It's something in the beginning, it was a bit random, right? I'm a bit rebellious. I like to listen to all these like liberal, a bit anarchy kind of thinking, right? You know, you know, I went to Netherlands was also because of that. Netherlands is one of the most liberal countries in the world, in, in Europe and also very, they're very liberal thinking. Amsterdam is one of the most international welcoming city in the world, right? I got to know Bitcoin was, it's also luck, but also destiny because I was immersed by all the liberal thinking, right? There's a lot of Dutch Bitcoin community there. So it was like that in the early days. At that time, there was no Ethereum even, right? In 2012, I could pick up just join banking company or a, like a traditional private equity firm, which is, I wouldn't say excites me that much. I studied behavioral finance. A lot of my Dutch alumni in my business school, they chose to choosing this kind of financial route, right? Tradify route. Whereas me and a few other kind of pretty interesting, sharp, I would say smart classmates, they all choose to one, working in tech companies or even started their own uh, startups. Some of them actually started doing Bitcoin mining even earlier than me. So if I choose to just double down on mining, I could become much more <laughs> bigger you know, OG in the Bitcoin space. It's unfortunate I didn't go for that route. I'm more on the software side. If I choose the, the hardware mining side since 2012, I might become a pretty big whale in Bitcoin, which is okay. So back to your question, I think it's really just like you being immersed with yourself in the, in the environment with the right mindset, right? Eventually leads to this kind of thinking, right? So it's like philosophically, you are average of the five people, which is the closest to you. So the people who were very close to me, around me, when I was in Netherlands and the beginning of crypto journey, was a lot of the people who like to think liberal, like a bit anarchy, who like to think about decentralization, who like the whole philosophy of, you know, Satoshi of ultrasound money, which doesn't really belong to the, you know, central governments and so on and so forth. That's that, right? And I think that's like a, just a nature evolution. I like to be getting immersed with you know, crypto stuff in the early days. Yeah. Before you co-founded BitLayer, you worked at some of the most well-known protocols and projects in the Web3 ecosystem. I'm talking about Polkadot, Tezos, Polygon. I'm curious how those experiences shaped your thinking about Web3 and community. 
obviously, it was just such a, a good luck and also a great honor to work with all these major protocols. So Polkadot was my major journey, really gets me become sort of financial independent. Polkadot, I made a good bet. I made a huge bet in the first round for two reasons. If you ask me why I like Polkadot in early days, because that was the first major protocol back, you know, built by a very solid engineering team, led by this great leader, Gavin Wood, who, who was Ethereum's co-CTO, who actually invented the whole EVM virtual machine, right? Who wrote the yellow paper of Ethereum. He did a lot of amazing work. So I was kind of following him about the whole Web3 journey. I translated a lot of his articles. When they started Polkadot together with like, you know, Polychain and a few other major VCs backing them, I knew it's going to be huge. So I put a lot of the money I had at that time, not too much actually, but I just jumped, went all in almost in the, as an early investor in the first round in 2017. And then because of the whole 2017 ICO bubble, I didn't went to a lot of those. It's kind of a short term, a bit pump and dump kind of ICO, you know, crazy mania. I was kind of just trying to find, understand. So what's next, right? We have, we have Ethereum. We have a lot of other layer, two, layer one chains. We need interoperability, right? So Polkadot was one of the best technology on there. And then they didn't have the East communities. You still need a lot of developers to work on the parachain chain and so on. So and at that time, I already see a good momentum. People want to talk about Polkadot in the Chinese community. At that time, I already came back from the Netherlands to China. And I was like, okay, it's time for me to really build a community. And, you know, founded by me and a few other investors who, who liked Polkadot as well. So from 2018, I helped Gavin when they actually came to China, I volunteered to be the interpreter and translator because they actually didn't speak Mandarin and a lot of the Chinese developers actually don't understand, you know, the high level of things they want to talk about in English. So through that, I actually get to know a lot of access to a lot of developers who needs help from us. And then you just become useful and uh, helpful, right, in the community. You start contributing more and more and I start access to like more VCs, more exchanges. I get a very close to Huobi from 2018. And eventually we started a brand called Poker Base, which is like Solana and Super Team kind of a relationship. So we're trying to work on the ecosystem. We eventually invest around 20 projects in Polkadot. And six of them we, we advised from A to Z. And three of them listed on Binance. That was a good journey. We made good returns on that. So Polkadot was a great round. And uh, the problem for Polkadot was they had to have the, this uh, tokenomics of parachain was very, very expensive. Whereas among the, the other like EVM chain, like Ethereum itself, deploying at the depths on Ethereum is relatively cheaper, right? Much cheaper uh, compared to Polkadot and Parachain slot. So the DeFi summer came in 2020 and a lot of the blue chip DeFi protocols really become very successful. Aave, Compound, Uniswap, right? So all these become like uh, getting a lot of mind share and you know, momentum. So that's why I kind of realized, okay, EVM got a win, Ethereum doesn't have a huge rally, and that's why I, I, I kind of deep dive more on other things. So Tezos was a very short journey. I only worked there less than two months. I got reached out by the head of APEC, my good friend, David, and they need help a bit. So I want to kind of just learn what's going on with other ecosystem outside of Polkadot. So, you know, get to know about Tezos a bit. Tezos had a, one of the biggest ICO in 2017. I didn't say I was a big fan of the, the company structure. It was very, very slow. And at that time, Polygon was also very growing very fast. I personally own Polygon since when they were, I was still Matic, right? And then they just, their FTV just keep going up because of the whole layer two narrative and so on. And then I got reached out by the Polygon team early 2021. So if I say Polkadot really gets me become a, a semi-financial independent and also learn a lot about building ecosystem, uh, Polygon journey really gets me become sort of well-known. I brought around 600 projects to Polygon ecosystem, a lot from China, uh, quite a lot other from like South Asia, Japan, and Korea as well, Vietnam as well. But uh, because of the whole gaming rally and also metaverse rally in 2021, so a lot of good projects, I get to know them. And a lot of the builders, they get to know me as well. The gap between the East and West, I was like, try my best to fill the gap. While you're being useful to a lot of people, they remember you, right? And that's pretty much it. So there's a lot of like small favor to each other, you know, help each other out. You know, sometimes even just some shout out on Twitter, and, you know, people remember you and so on. So that journey was great to help me for Bill Layer because now we're building ecosystem for ourselves, right, on the team. Now we're fundraising, talking to community, talking to builders. A lot of people get to know me since 2021. So it's not like, okay, a very cold connection. We just know each other or somehow in an event. 
you know, it, they actually know, oh, I know this person in 2021. Oh, he was pretty active on Polygon and so on. Oh, uh, my friend's project was, you know, was deployed on Polygon and th th this guy actually helped a bit and so on. Although those are very ad hoc or some kind of uh, uh, like very small data points, but those data points matters when you start actually reaching out to a lot of people, right? When you have nothing to really reference, it's difficult to make people trust you, but you have some track record, even though it's a very small track record, sometimes people can argue it's a very superficial track record because it's not like millions, even billions of dollars of transactions, right? It's just somehow, you know, some simple tweets or some kind of events. Even with that, it can be very helpful to, uh, to go along the journey. So I think the whole journey of Billy has become very, very fulfilling. And also we had a lot of re old friends reunion. Right, you know, from different ecosystem. It's been a great journey so far already. We started Bit Layer seven months ago, and a lot of people build on Bit Layer actually are come from different ecosystem, from Polkadot, from Polygon, from a lot of Ethereum and uh, Layer twos. Those, those are some kind of old friends. Those three journeys of working on a major, like multi billion, even t over ten billion FTV major platform, and gets me pretty well equipped with the knowledge and the context. The GRTIQ podcast is made possible by a generous grant from the Graph Foundation. The Graph Grants program provides support for protocol infrastructure, tooling, gaps, subgraphs, and community building efforts. Learn more at the Graph.Foundation. That's the Graph.Foundation. Hi, this is GRTIQ, and thank you for listening. Listeners who enjoy this content can help support the GRTIQ podcast by leaving a review or a five-star rating wherever they download podcasts, by sharing episodes on social media, or by simply telling a friend or colleague about something they heard or learned from one of our guests. It's support from listeners like you that make it possible for us to keep shining a light on the people and stories behind Web3 and the graph. when you think about Asia and that region of the world's history and its future as it relates to Web3, driving growth, driving innovation, how do you contextualize that? How do you think through that? Asia is very important always for the Web3 in terms of community. When we talk about mass adoption, a lot of the consumer-facing application is very important, right? We can't just say mass adoption when you have only two or three major corporates users, right? And uh, we could argue most of the Web3 active users are, are now very consumer facing. When we talk about DeFi, when we talk about gaming, NFT, a lot of them are very consumer facing applications now. Then you need users. And a Web3 application in terms of the philosophy is about free, it's in terms of liberal, in terms of decentralization, right? A lot of the developing countries, their philosophy, their culture fits into the, you know, their community demand a lot. China is one example. There's a lot of uh, people wants to find out the alternative solution in terms of how to make uh, good, good money, how to learn about things and things, how to look at for new opportunities. Web3 give them the, this perfect alternative. While you have a daily job in the Web2 or the Web1 world, this is an actually interesting place for you to tap into, right? If you educate yourself well, you start learning about how to do DeFi, all kinds of things, you actually can be, make decent income you know, outside of a day job. So that was a perfect, very practical product market fit, right, for a lot of the Asia community users. We were just in GM Vietnam conference last week. We meaning Billy. We hosted multiple events. We was we were speaker there. We had a booth. We hosted a, our Billy night. A lot of Vietnamese community members came over. So Vietnam is one very important country in, in Asia as well. In, they have the highest crypto penetrated rate in the world. Over 40% of the citizens in Vietnam, especially the young population, actually use crypto in daily basis, right? So some of them made generational wealth, right, for them, because it's a low cost in you know, a country. Some of those, you know, the, the yield they made on DeFi summer basically changed their life a lot. So there's a lot of in interesting story on that, you know, in the last couple of years. So I would say Asia is very important because at the end of the day, while everybody kind of talking about changing the world, bring mass adoption Web3, we could argue and also criticize. Like, do you know who is your user? Where are your user come from? What is the problem you're solving them? If you don't even understand where a user, 
the whole mass adoption change in the world is becoming a cliche. Because at the end of the day, it's about where the user come from, how to solve their problem, why your product is better than the others, right? For most of consumer facing applications right now, within Bitcoin ecosystem or even outside in the Ethereum, I would say I could argue almost half of the user base that come from Asia, right? A lot of unchain activities come from Asia. So it's a very important community. For the, a lot of Western builders and entrepreneurs, the ones actually being very successful, including Polkadot and a few other like protocol level projects as well. So a lot of them have been very successful finding their product market fit, right? You know, finding a way to build local community. I would say it's not necessarily our competitor, but the, like some kind of friends project, right? Monad this year have been doing an amazing job in the Asia community. So in Singapore, in, in Vietnam, in other countries as well, they've been building a very successful grassroots community. That's something Billayer is kicking off. We're trying our best to do that as well. So being a global project from day one, you know, backed by global well-known VCs with Signal, that's also very, all those are very important. But at the end of the day, once you're hitting to token launch, product launch, when you have actually something to use by the customers, by the, by the average retail, it's all about building community locally, you know, tapping to local grassroots. So Asia community for a lot of Western founders has been like a little bit mysterious, you know, for a lot of Western founders who actually don't bother to learn and actually made their efforts to build a grassroots community. I think one, it's a big mistake. They have to do it. Second, whoever actually can crack that nut in a very good way, working with the local partners fairly well, they can be successful. There's a lot of data points already, right? Well, Charlie, as we've both mentioned a couple of times, we're talking today because you co-founded BitLayer, and I'm very curious about what's going on there and some of the innovation that's happening in that space. Before we talk a little bit more about that, do you mind just taking us back in time to what the origins are, where the ideas or the seeds for the ideas of BitLayer came from? Sure. So I didn't mention too much about my Bitcoin journey, right? I mean, I worked in Polkadot, Polygon, Tezos, you know, all these you know, proof of stake ecosystem or like Ethereum stuff in the past. I never claim, and I'm, I'm not a Bitcoin OG per se, right? Compared to the people who co-founded the Bitcoin.com or, or the other Bitcoin miners, I'm more like ETH guy. In early 2023, I completely orange peeled myself. You know, the journey started from the beginning of Ordinals. One of my friends was the first person actually inscribed something. You know, they, he inscribed the entire Bitcoin white paper on Bitcoin on, through all of those. So I was like, wow, interesting. You can actually can put data on Bitcoin on, on SATs now, all the JSON data and so stuff, right? I started following Casey, who, you know, who created the Ordinals protocol. I also kind of just having a crash course myself to learn what is BIP 4379, you know, what is the taproot asset upgrade and so on. So Ordinals was basically based on that, right? To bring inscribed data on Bitcoin and on sets. That's a great idea. And eventually we have like Bitcoin NFTs and then later on fungible token and standard BRC20 on that. We could say last year in 2023, doing this uh, still in the bear cycle, Bitcoin ecosystem has this interesting builder culture back, this interesting ICO or small NFT summer. We couldn't call this a DeFi summer because you can't really do DeFi applications like because there's, there's no smart contract at Bitcoin layer one, right? Bitcoin as a layer one is UTXO cash system. You can do payments, you can do a lot of transactions. With all of those, you can do you can inscribe data, creating assets on Bitcoin on a network natively, which is great, right? So the whole narrative from beginning, Bitcoin NFT was more na- native than Ethereum NFT, which was an exciting narrative. That got me thinking as well, right? Most of Ethereum NFT, the JPEG file is actually stored by a third party, no matter it's IPFS or Arweave or just AWS. Whereas Bitcoin Ordinals, it's actually natively inscribed on Bitcoin Layer 1. It's tamper-proof. It's always there. So that's kind of a very interesting narrative. A lot of people now move back to Bitcoin. Oh, Bitcoin NFT is actually cooler and all that. So I was part of the journey that as that, right? And then BRC20 token came out. Obviously, that was interesting. Like we we start inscribing all the later on sets, and then pretty much the whole BRC twenty summer last year was almost every two weeks there's some new narrative, right? The whole seven months of BRC twenty summer kind of went through almost seven years of Ethereum, right? So there's a lot of uh, primitive. I was kind of OG, sort of OG, and we couldn't call it OG. It was literally just last year we were kind of early tapping to all kinds of narrative. So I was like trying to be the builder. I was on Twitter space almost three times a day. 
educating the space, educating my com- the community I know about what is BRC20, what is this recursive inscription, what is rare assets, what is BitMap, what is Bitcoin Metaverse, what is this and all this NFT about. So all this is very interesting. The idea of building Bitly, uh, you know, is after September. And oh, by the way, I, w- I got invited as a speaker in the September Arno Summit. So I, that's where the place I met Domo and Casey, right? And a bunch of other key builders who basically initiated the whole BRC20 summer, right? Or Arno summer last year. It was great to meet those people in person. It was great to hear their concerns about the vision. What's next, right? We have all this UTXO generated every day. Some of the UTXO are kind of garbage, right? We could argue that was the reason some arguments from the Bitcoin core, like Luke and a few other guys, they want to wipe out the entire Ordinals on Bitcoin right, with upgradation. So instead of thinking about Ordinals and all that, right, they went to wipe them out with the upgradation on, the, on protocol layer of Bitcoin layer one. My thinking after the Ordinals summit was we need to scale Bitcoin. We need to offload all these things, either off chain or layer two. If we really want to bring mass adoption around the Bitcoin ecosystem, it shouldn't be on Bitcoin layer one. Bitcoin as an ultrasound money, Bitcoin as a network should be like that, it's, which is safe, which is secure, which is decentralized. Bitcoin as a network never designed to scale into like, you know, like a SWE, Solana, those kind of uh, level, right? It just designed in a different way. Bitcoin in the past trying to build this smart contract layer on top of it, right? We had a color coin and later on, Rootstock, Stacks trying to do that. But it, after we doing research, we realized like, all these semi failed or didn't really pick up kind of an ecosystem on Bitcoin. They don't have the Bitcoin finality, right? Meaning all these side chains they have they have to have trust their own node system, right? The, the, the security assumption is different. You can't really verify all the you know, all these smart contract trans- transactions back to Bitcoin. So that's a key difference. If we are able to achieve Bitcoin finality, right, with a scaling solution. That's a key difference to move the needle. Second is, what are the solutions we can pick up in the space, which we can bring the whole programmability from Ethereum back to Bitcoin, right? Whereas actually have the same access of security level. So uh, coincidentally, we saw a bit VM white paper came out, right? It was a research result by this Bitcoin researcher, um, Robert Linux from Germany. He was pretty active on, on the Ethereum, on the you know, Stockware ecosystem. Stockware actually uh, gave them a grant as well and so on. He's a very research-driven academic person. After that white paper like in October came out, it gets me really excited about, okay, this is very interesting because besides BitVM, there's a few other approaches as well, like Lightning, uh, Nostra, and then you know, the list goes on, like some RGB++. BitVM is a very interesting solution that actually could, without actually upgrading the whole Bitcoin network, Without actually hard fork or op, like BIP, we could use the existing Bitcoin opcode to verify the state transition from layer two and so on. So, and also, if we able to build a layer two, which the state transition verified on layer one, which we can basically bring the programmability from the from Ethereum to Bitcoin, but have the same security level of Bitcoin. So that's actually a very beautiful technical bet, right? So that's why for me, this is something we I, I get excited. That's why. I start reaching out to a lot of people I know. I start reaching out to my current co-founder, Kevin. We know each other since 2021. When I was in Polygon, he was Heckle. Heckle is a Huobi ecosystem chain. The, the, the reason we know each other was because Heckle chain, a lot of projects wants to go global. So a lot of the, their ecosystem project wants to go multi-chain. They reach out to me because they want to you know, deploy on, on Polygon. It's all, both, both of them are EVM compatible, right? So it's like easy to migrate and so on. So and a lot of the Heckle projects shared, okay, Heckle as a technology is very solid. So I know who, whoever built Heckle was pretty solid. That's Kevin. We have a very aligned technical vision about how to scale Bitcoin, how Bitcoin ecosystem should look like. We have a very aligned vision. That's very important. When we have aligned vision, when we talk about the operational stuff, we get excited. Okay, so the idea of BitLayers came from just doing research about Bitcoin scaling, how to achieve Bitcoin finality, Bitcoin scaling as a research group. We didn't start as a, as a real Web3 project per se. In early November, we were kind of just doing research, writing articles. And then we saw other projects. Babylon started raising money. Merlin started really getting, become hot. B-Square, a few other projects kind of start really kicking off. They raised some money. They, we saw some announcement. Some of them having 
a, a hard time to articulate the, what the problems they want to solve. But uh, we see the momentum, right? VC start actually backing on that. For us, it's like it's a great opportunity for us to relay the experience of building ecosystem on Ethereum, but using the new approach of without actually asking Bitcoin to do a hard fork on it, building a solution which can could scale Bitcoin, right? So that's interesting. So me and Kevin, we start really kind of talking about okay, we should start a project actually on, on around layer two and try to be the first native layer two, right? With a row up model, row up equivalent and achieve this, you know, Bitcoin finality. So the journey started pretty simple. We start to talking to some of the Bitcoin OGs. We start talking to some Bitcoin uh, ecosystem VCs. We pitched to OKX and a few other VCs actually eventually backed us. And then I went over to Satoshi Roundtable in Dubai. I went over to East Denver. A lot of people start talking about Bitcoin. A lot of people start talking about BV and everything. And then, you know, eventually we get a, we finished the seed round uh, three years, three months ago. And the whole journey started really getting accelerated. We started hiring people. We as quickly assembled the engineering team. A lot of them actually worked for Kevin before in since 2021. So it's almost like a war cry, right? We it's a, with a great vision. We have an interesting opportunity and a time window to build something which could be unique. So a lot of engineers willing to take a pay cut to join the team. And so we we've been growing the team very fast. So if you ask us how, how many people in Bay right now, we are one of the biggest engineering team in the Bitcoin layer two space. We have our, around 50 engineers now, 40 full-time, 10 like part-time researchers and so on. So we have all together around 70 people now working very actively on the ecosystem. Yeah, so it's been an amazing journey. I think we are one of the most active ecosystem in terms of on-chain transactions. We have over 100 projects deployed on the chain already. And we're making revenue on on-chain gas fee as we speak every day as well. Yeah. So as you mentioned there, it's been amazing to watch the Bitcoin programmability and all the different things kind of emerge in the last year. I mean, as an outsider, this is something that really just showed up on the scene, something in the bear market that was incredible to watch. And here we have all these L2s. Talk about how BitLayer is unique or different or how it's approaching this scalability issue differently than others in that space. It's a great question. It's also a question a lot of investors, a lot of developers keep asking. I think two parameters are very important. Where we are on the Bitcoin ecosystem at the status quo right now is, is a bunch of side chain, right? With the security assumption is the chain needs to be safe, right? Without Bitcoin finality, meaning they don't really let their state transition of the layer two eventually verified on Bitcoin, right? So our assumption is we trust Bitcoin. We trust things eventually inscribed on Bitcoin layer one is secure. So how to put the state transition, the layer two, we, into a ZK validity proof, right? On Bitcoin is very important. So our approach with BVM is, uh, there's like multiple version of BVM, by the way. BVM is this, it's not a Bitcoin virtual machine. It's Bitcoin verification. To eventually add this verification capability, right? Because Bitcoin as a UTXO upcode kind of network didn't really have the verification layer, right? So all kinds of smart contracts in you know, a transaction on, happen on sidechain or layer two. How to verify that on Bitcoin is a key module we're building on. That's the first thing, layer one verification. Second thing is trust minimized bridge. So we have this model we came up with, use a DLC technology, which is called a discrete log contract together with BVM to create this decentralized Oracle signer network. So it's a native two-way pack and a multi-sig. The users have one pair of the multi-sig. And as long as we just need trust among all the decentralized signer network in, in the Oracle platform, one signer is honest, then it's two to two packed. The bridge is safe and good to go. Whereas the existing status quo is we have to trust the majority of signers in the multi-signature, in the MPC, is, is honest. So for the trust assumption is from majority honest the existing to us is one out of n is honest, then we are good to go. So we, we wouldn't say it's 100% trustless, but it's way less trust dependent. That's the model you're going to work on, which is practical, and we are going to deliver that in the next couple coming months. In terms of pure 100% trustless model, that's something we're still under research. We haven't really found that much practical route. And I think making the trust assumption Way multiple magnitudes lower from trust majority to one out of n 
is already move the needle in a massive way, right? That allow a lot of Bitcoin OGs or, or whales to consider with the right amount of APY or incentive to bridge their native Bitcoin into layer two and so on. Right? Whereas right now they have to trust the multi-signature, which is centralized and so on, right? So that's a key solution. Layer one verification through BVM, trust minimized bridge through the DLC and BVM to work on that. The third solution we want to build, which make us different is Right now, BitLayer is 100% EVM compatible. So deploying on BitLayer is exact same experience like deploying on Arbitron, Optimism, so to speak. We use the complete like toolkits on you know Web3 uh, infrastructure routes, tech stack, as many other existing battle test chain. Right. Eventually, what we envision is in order to achieve the best developer friendliness, we need to be multiple VM compatible. So we're working closely with Solana with uh, Stuckware on the Solana VM and the Cairo VM. And I think along with now, we have a one of a very big narrative called a parallelism EVM, right? Like Monad, I feel the project kind of working on that. So we want to see and to build this like layered virtual machine to make like to support multiple VM for developers who not just to build EVM smart contracts, but also other smart contracts to be able to deploy on build layer natively. So that's a th- the third part of solution we want to work on. But I think in terms of priority, the highest priority is layer one verification, right? To truly build a real layer two, not just sidechain, is something Bit Layer is focusing on. We are six to 12 months away in, in terms of engineering. The V2 version is going to be centered around that. We are already V1 version mainnet. We launched our chain. We launched our, our EVM compatible version. We're going to work on the bridge, which we mentioned is the second solution, the trust minimized bridge. And then once we have the real layer one verification with BVM, then Bit layer is going to be one of the first native layer two uh, with the same security level of layer one. So that gets us very different and unique compared to many other layer twos in the space. You've mentioned Starkware a couple of times. I had the opportunity to interview Uri, one of the co-founders of there for episode 152, and it's still one of my favorites, a brilliant guy. And I know the team over there is incredibly smart and working on some cool stuff. Starkware is our investor and it's great a partner. Great to have them into and working with us. Yeah, they are one of the best ZK team in the world. We are working with them closely using their ZK proof, but we're working on our own in-house kind of ZK verification through this Bitcoin FI verifier. So that's kind of our proprietary technology we're working on, on the layer one verification side. Yeah. Are there any news or announcements you can tease or any alpha you can drop about things that are coming to the BitLayer community? Oh, that's quite a lot, actually. So... BitLayer mainnet V1 launched six weeks ago, right? We have been dropping quite a lot of interesting assets. We dropped our OG pass NFT, which get minted out within two hours. We had a, a, around 100 projects already minted on, you know, deployed on our chain. A few projects are in the DeFi space, quite a lot of on DeFi space, like across lending, DEXs, you know, stable coins and so on. And a few others on NFT, you know, gaming space. So I think the best way is to look at our Twitter, but I think in terms of real alpha, alpha per se is there's four days later on June 18th. Yeah, we will have the Cryptopedia ecosystem campaign featured on OKX Wallet. So OKX is our investor. OKX Wallet is one of the best multi-chain wallet right now with 60 million users, very active. We are expecting 6 million users from their wallets will, will interact with our ecosystem campaign, which is one month long. So for the listener who are listening to our podcast, if you uh, use you know OKX wallet, if you interact on the bit layer ecosystem campaign, you will be one way or the other entitled with some you know interesting rewards or even airdrops from the ecosystem project. We feature them. It will be seven of them across like NFT project, gaming project, and uh, DeFi protocols on bit layer, and of course some of the bit layer token itself, which we will plan to launch maybe August, maybe September. The dates are not confirmed yet. So that's like a major alpha. You're going to see from OKX Wallet. Uh, if you have that, you can just check on the Discovery channel. If you don't have OKX Wallet, I would recommend you to use that. It's one of the best user experience wallet and so far I've been using since last year. They are very Bitcoin friendly. They are compatible to all kinds of Rune assets, BRC20 token assets as well. Yeah. Charlie, for any listeners that are like me, they've seen all the great things going on in the Bitcoin community. They're very intrigued by the L2 story. And of course, what we're talking about today regarding BitLayer, what's the best way for them to get active in the community, find something to do, go to work, uh, contribute? What would you say? 
We have the ambassador program, which we rolling out another season soon. So for the people who actually want to contribute, that's the best way to engage. We have the some of the ecosystem badges, you know, some kind of tier system for the community members. For the people who are actually still kind of figuring out to learn, best way to follow our Twitter, check our website at billayer.org. If you're a developer, we have a pretty sophisticated and well-written in documentation uh, on the website. You can check it out and get started. We have a few hackathons and developer community events. We just got onboarded another DevRail person. She's a pretty experienced in the Farcaster community now joining us full-time. We have one of the youngest in the history you know, st- uh, engineer from Stocknet. He's our global head of DevRel. So I think we are very paying a lot of efforts and also attention to the developer engagement. For the retail who actually don't code, right? For the, for the users who wants to just degen in, right? I, I personally was a degen myself as well. I think just kind of tap into the Telegram community, right? You know, join Discord. Uh, our community ambassador, some of the you know, moderators sometimes share some interesting offer. Jump on our community calls like every week. You know, there's sometimes we have some community call. It's not even uh, initiated by our official person. Sometimes they just jam ideas and so on. Oh, this this project which launched the prime our chain. You know, this project. You know, and there might be some interesting point system going on. Tap into that. Oh, Bismarty, a few other protocols, right? They have this new things coming along the way. I, I don't want to name drop too much, but it's like a lot of those top performing projects. Have a lot of interesting stuff. And uh, one of my favorite, personally, I would say, is that there's a perp dex called a Rodex. They just launched two days ago, had a tremendous amount of growth in the last 48 hours. For the people who want to trade on chain with like perp dex, that's an interesting one. Oh, so for BitLayer, I mean, imagine us like a Bitcoin version of Arbitron, right? We're looking for good applications like GMX on our chain. So we're looking for potential ones like Rodex as well on that. Yeah. Charlie, for those that are kind of thinking through what L2 and Bitcoin and how that whole thing kind of works, if we contrast or compare what happened at Ethereum with the proliferation of L2s, and we see what's kind of happening with Bitcoin and L2s, how will the story at Bitcoin be different? How will the L2s compare or contrast with what we've seen on Ethereum? Well, Bitcoin has a very unique culture, right? You know, we had Ethereum... With all due respect, we still have this centralized entity, which is what we consider as, a, as official, which is a Ethereum Foundation or consensus. Bitcoin doesn't have that. Bitcoin Foundation is, is just like a symbolic thing, right? It's not like necessarily making too much decisions. Satoshi and core devs play an important role, but now also become very, very decentralized. It was very miner-driven, miner-centric community. Now, with the Bitcoin ecosystem, with the layer twos, all they become more and more developer driven, but it's also very decentralized. Meaning the Bitcoin layer two space will be more free market driven, focus on finding product market fit, finding your own niche, and having the supply demand equilibrium. Compared to Ethereum, Ethereum is much more, okay, are you OG? Do you know this person? Do you know that person? Are you built something in the track record? Do your community like you, for example, Ethereum Foundation? If not, you're nobody. I think that's very, maybe not accurate, but I see by working with Ethereum, by working in the Ethereum layer tools, I feel working in Bitcoin ecosystem is very different on this part. On the programmability side, because we're EVM compatible, a lot, lot, lot of other layer tools are EVM compatible as well. Onboarding depths, engineering wise, is very similar. There's not too much difference. The culture, which I mentioned, is different, right? The other thing is different is liquidity. Bitcoin has much bigger market cap than Ethereum, right? A lot of Bitcoin liquidity has been sitting in their cold wallets, not being like a yield-bearing assets for 15 years. Now we have all these staking protocols like Babylon, all the other kind of native yield-bearing you know, protocols coming along the ways. We might really unlock, let's say, just 10% of the liquidity on Bitcoin, right? We can have a very interesting new flood of liquidity on DeFi summer. That's very exciting. We're expecting to see multiple programmable BTC coming along the way. In history, we had a wrapped Bitcoin, WBTC, right? Which was funded by BitGo in a more centralized kind of way, which is okay. And now we're seeing more and more new BTC coming along, like Lorenzo, which is doing STBTC. Lombard, it's a new protocol, now doing the LBTC. One of the major mining farm called Ant Alpha. Bitmain, also they're doing the FBTC. So more and more type of programmable Bitcoin, you know, which will be uh, minted on layer two, like including BitLayer, will come along the way. So it's one-to-one packed with native Bitcoin, 
But now on the layer two side, which are also more programmable, you know, those are things interesting and exciting. And it's very unique. Yeah. Charlie, as we talked earlier a little bit about your background working in Asia, building community there on some really notable projects and doing some things in the Ethereum space. A lot of my listeners are enthusiastic about the graph and the future of the graph. I'm just curious in your prior journey, if you ever came into contact or what your perspective of was the graph as it relates to that experience. I'm a big fan of graph since 2020. Graph has been a very important middleware Web3 infrastructure for a while. While I was in Polygon, I was in multiple groups with the Graph co-founder. I'm personally a good friend with Iris. I don't know if I, it's okay to actually mention her name. Uh, she's a good friend. We, we were in multiple panels together, uh, Twitter space together since 2021. So quite a lot of the things and, and the impression I got about Graph was from her and from the co-founder. In the Bitcoin ecosystem, since we are also EVM compatible, we need... Web3 infrastructure middleware, like the graph, we're talking to layer zero, we're talking to a few other kind of along the way as well. They are serving a very important function, right, in the ecosystem. So for us, now we are building ecosystem, we're definitely exploring collaboration. And I have only good words to say about graph, not, not too much else. Yeah. Charlie, I only have a couple more questions for you before I ask you the GRT IQ 10. And these are 10 fun questions I ask each guest of the podcast every week. The first question is, Let's talk about what's changed since you got active in the Web3 space. I mean, it's only been a short while since you've been kind of full-time in Web3, but it seems like decades or centuries of growth and development. How has the space changed? The space changed a lot. You know, in the beginning, it was a bunch of cryptologists, anarchy-thinking, liberal people, right? Very small niche of group. Sometimes we call this outliers. We call this the minorities. Right, and so on, so on and so forth. Now, this is our, my, kind of my third cycle, right? We, every cycle, we see more and more people in terms of builders, in terms of you know, users coming a long way. It's getting more and more mainstream, which is good. That's what we need. It's getting more and more liquidity, right? Now, institution money coming with ETF and so on. So the space definitely changed. The regulators now getting more and more educated about what is crypto, what is digital assets, how we regulate, regulate that. The corporates are also now talking about Web3 as a one of the key strategy in pretty much every single annual meetings and so on. Technology-wise, we had developed so much, right? In the beginning was smart contract. Now we have interoperability. We have all the scaling solution from Plasma, Validium, now to Optimism Rollup, ZK Rollup, right? And now we're working on Privy, you know, around Bitcoin stuff. A lot of technology has been developed throughout the cycle. Most of technology actually developed during the bear cycle because there's not too much to talk about. You know, the people can only build. On the bull cycle, we have a lot of product market fit. You know, users get excited. You know, people who build a product actually can find their users, have effective marketing and so on. So the space changes so much in a way. I think for some people, it's getting a bit hard for them to find next great idea. Nobody else did before. Nobody else discovered it before, right? Which is so unique, so new, that potential can change the world. Those kind of list of ideas and things getting less and less. Meaning there's a lot of things that have been, have been, there, been there down there already. Many things failed. Certain things worked, right? And a certain projects still kind of still there, right? I think it's, a, it's about survive. For the project has been started like since 2014, 15, majority of them actually died due to various reasons, right? The ones actually still there, uh, some of them are doing well, very well. So it's a very cyclical industry. In order to survive throughout different cycle, uh, across the cycle, is very important. It's something definitely very humbling for us now that I'm building Billier, try to survive the cycle, especially on the bear, uh, to be long-term project, which is something very difficult, but uh, and challenging, and we try our best to do that. And then the last question I want to ask you, Charlie, is you've mentioned a couple of times these themes or narratives that emerge every cycle. We got DeFi summer, we got the ICO boom, all these different things that happened. As you look forward to the cycle we're in now, or maybe the forthcoming cycle, what are going to be the one or two narratives you think that sort of define this one? That's something I wouldn't say I'm the best expert to give answer, but I'm from my humble Experience observation, I see Deeping getting a very exciting narrative, especially from other ecosystems like Solana, 
on the base, which is a very you know high performance chain with very low gas fee. They try to un- onboard a lot of the kind of hardware IoT stuff. I personally was like, from my childhood. I was very hardware fan. I saw a lot of the people kind of working on that, you know, with some kind of smart hardware, you know, IoT stuff. Hardware IoT is not new, right? It's been there even before crypto. And now they kind of thinking about doing like this kind of decentralized network with an incentive layer, with tokens and so on. But if we talk about economically, it's something similar as gaming cycle last year. Although, unfortunately, gaming, most of gaming doesn't work because the, the, the quality was not good. They didn't, they didn't manage to acquire the users from Web 2 to Web 3, right? A lot of gaming projects actually fail. Now, this deeping is interesting in a way. I see a lot of new wave of users might potentially interact with blockchain you know, through that, right? So for me, now that I'm building infrastructure, if I look at what kind of application narrative, which gets me exciting, are the ones that actually can bring new users. That, that can bring new users to the Web3 space for legitimate reason, not just, just for speculation, but for other reasons, right? In 2021, that was gaming, potentially. Like, that was Metaverse because of the big company, Facebook, kind of doing that, promoting a lot. We're talking about whole, you know, digital world, digital society. And NFT, we could argue. Just because of the culture, because of the community vibe, people like to purchase that JPEG on, you know, put that on the Twitter profile. I would argue that was a good adoption. A lot of my friends who never use crypto, they purchased Ethereum and bought their NFT in 2021. They, that was kind of the way they entered crypto space. That's very important. So for me, that's my criteria to evaluate if this narrative actually makes sense. What I'm looking at right now, DPing could be one of them. A lot of people are talking about AI. I'm not an AI expert at all. I'm still learning about how certain decentralized AI model works. I use OpenAI every day pretty much, right? So how does this Web3 version of AI can make a difference? We're still learning. For BitLayer as ecosystem, because we have this philosophy of free market, so we try to do not make too much decision and saying certain narrative is better than the others. I think a lot of developers in their domain knowledge is, is more knowledgeable and smarter than us. So we just trying to help them if they want to deploy on build layer. We help them on go-to-market strategy, a few other things. We don't really finger pointing, you should do this and that, right? But uh, if they need help, we try our best to fix, uh, help figure out the you know, tokenomics, a bunch of other things, right? But uh, we wouldn't be the person kind of saying, we only to do that because we believe in that. We have only one sector focused ecosystem. We are actually chain agnostic and uh, we are actually ecosystem agnostic per se. Well, Charlie, now we've reached a point where I'm going to ask you the GRTIQ 10. I ask these questions every week. They give us a chance to get to know you personally, but also I hope these questions help listeners learn something new, try something different, or achieve more in their own life. So, Charlie, are you ready for the GRTIQ 10? Please. The GRTIQ 10. This is the way. 10 questions for astronauts floating in space. What book or article has had the most impact on your life? anti fragile Is there a movie or a TV show that you would recommend everybody should watch? Matrix. If you could only listen to one music album for the rest of your life, which one would you choose? The Metallica Black Album. What's the best advice someone's ever given to you? Never underestimate the heart of the champion, right? That's kind of a slogan for both team. Yeah. Do not underestimate some of the people who has a big drive. Yeah. Charlie, what's one thing you've learned in your life that you don't think most other people have learned or know yet? Well, that's that's too deep. That's not a TLDI version of a question. <laughs> to be diplomatic. The world is so big. To be the bridge between West and East is very important. Whoever can do that, especially in Web3, is actually very useful. Yeah. What's the best life hack you've discovered for yourself? People like to procrastinate. I have my principle is like if certain things which is some, somehow important, if I can finish that within a minute, I do that right away and I can move on. Yeah. And how about this one? Based on your own life experience and observations, what's the one habit or characteristic that you think makes people successful in life? A lot of the successful people keep this crazy discipline of make things in order. I have this as a zero inbox policy. I don't really miss certain things. I tried to make things in order, and we have been very effectively, efficiently grow things. Yeah. And then, Charlie, the final three questions are complete the sentence type questions. So the first one is, the thing that most excites me about the future of Web3 is? Bitcoin ecosystem. 
And if you're on X, formerly Twitter, I still call it Twitter, you should be following Charlie Who Sets. And then the final question, Charlie, I'm happiest when? I'm happiest when I see certain people get their problem fixed. The GRT IQ 10. And I show you how deep the podcast Charlie, thank you so much for joining the GRT IQ podcast. It was a lot of fun to talk to you and to learn more about what's going on in the Bitcoin space and particularly at BitLayer. You shared a lot of great information today. I'll put links in the show notes for listeners that want to stay in touch and follow that. If listeners want to stay in touch with you, Charlie, follow the things that you're working on. What's the best way for them to stay in touch? Uh, follow us on Twitter. That's the best way. BitLayer Labs, that's our official Twitter. My personal Twitter is Charlie Who Sets. It's a pleasure to talk to you, Nick. Great to be on the podcast. I really I had a great time together. I'm looking forward for the next one. This has been a production of the GRT IQ podcast. For more information, including detailed show notes, visit grtiq.com slash podcast. That's grtiq.com slash podcast. This project and helping build the community by subscribing and leaving a review. G R T I Q Podcast.